In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Perseverance family, it's great to be with you. And as always, we'd like to start off our conversation today by inviting the Blessed Mother to be with us. Mary has many titles, and among which are Mary is the Mother of God, Mary is the Mother of the Church, Mary is the Mother of each and every one of us. Also, we invoke Mary and the Hail Holy Queen. Mary is our life, Mary is our life, Mary is our sweetness, and she's our hope. So let's uh, lift up our hearts, our minds, our souls to God through Mary by praying the prayer that Mary loves most. That prayer is the Hail Mary. Together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So now we'd like to invite to be with us Mary. We'd like to invite to be with us our spiritual guide or director. Our spiritual guide or director is, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has many titles. And uh, some of the titles are the following. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete. The Holy Spirit is the gift of gifts. The Holy Spirit is also known as our sanctifier. The Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our souls. Holy Spirit is also known as our counselor. Holy Spirit is also known as our consoler. Holy Spirit is also known as our intimate friend. And St. Paul says the Holy Spirit teaches how to pray. St. Paul says we, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but it is through the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us with ineffable groans so we can say Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's ask the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light, a lot of peace, a lot of joy on the feast day of another great saint. So let's uh, pray to the Holy Spirit with these words. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in this consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lady Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Saint Michael, pray for us. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Raphael, pray for us. Saint Ignatius, pray for us. Saint Faustina, pray for us. Saint John Maria Vianney, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. So welcome all to our Perseverance family, and 
By means of encouragement, I will pray for all of you. In the Opus Dei. And that means in the great work of God. The great work of God is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So when I celebrate my Mass today, I'd like to place you on the altar. And your intentions. And I'd like to offer these intentions for you. First of all, for our sanctification. That all of us will strive to become the person that God wants us to be. And that is to become the saint that God wants us to be. As we celebrate a saint today. So I'd like to pray for all of you in a very special way for your sanctification. Pull into mind the words of, our, of Jesus himself. Be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. My second intention would be I'd like to pray for your families. For those that you have charge over, your children and some of your grandparents. That these days or weeks of vacation would not be wasted by laziness, but you would help your children to use their time profitably. That means that uh, time is a precious gift to all of us. We should use it. We should use it in a way that's pleasing to God. Bring your children to daily mass. Here in the parish, we have four masses: six, eight, twelve, and six. Have them carry out their chores and keep your home in orderly place. And get your children to play sports. Get out there and do physical exercise. Physical activity is good for us. Then from sports to reading, reading good books can nourish our minds. Yes, reading good books can nourish our minds. They, books can be our best friends. Then allow your children to cultivate good friends. A good friend can be a true treasure, no doubt about that. A good friend can truly be a good treasure, no doubt about that. So, also have your children cultivate their talents and to avoid laziness. What might be these talents? It might be musical talents, learning how to play the piano. Artistic talents, learning how to paint. Writing talents, learning to write essays or poems. Social talents, learning how to speak. All these are talents that God gives to us. And we're called to use these talents to sanctify ourselves as well as to build up the kingdom. So motivate your children to use these days profitably. Then the, then the third intention I'd like to offer for you would be that all of us would have a real strong desire to grow in our prayer life. Yes. Because our sanctification our sanctification, our growth in holiness. Our sanctification, our growth in holiness depends a lot upon our prayer life. Upon our prayer life. May God help us to grow in our prayer life. Because we become holy in as much as we're united to God. Our union with God comes especially through our life of prayer and our sacramental life. So those are my intentions I'd like to offer to all of you in our Perseverance family. And you'll pray for me and I'll, I will pray for you. Yesterday, 
in our conversation on the readings, I spent most of my time commenting upon the first reading. I'd like to just give a summary of that, and then we'll move on to the topic for the today. We have a beautiful gospel reading, and we have a great saint. But yesterday we had a first reading, which was a reading in which Moses' brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, were complaining behind Moses, about Moses behind his back. Let's say in Spanish, chismosos. And they're complaining because he married a woman that was not a Jew, a Cushite woman. So God, it's interesting, everything we say, everything we think, all of our actions are seen by God. Nothing can escape God. Absolutely nothing can escape God. So God aware of this criticism against Moses. God's, God calls Moses and Aaron and his sister into the meeting tent, which was the place of prayer. And God defends Moses. He says to Miriam and Aaron, To some people I speak through dreams and visions and through riddles. But Moses, no. Moses, I speak to him face to face, like two friends speaking. And then God, not pleased at all with Aaron and Miriam. Actually, God is very angry. So God, God punishes Miriam by turning her into a leper. Her flesh became as white as the snow. She became a leper. A leper. And Aaron, looking at his sister, says, Oh, God, have mercy, and turns to Moses, and turns to Moses, asking Moses to heal their sister, and Moses looks and says, Lord, Lord, no, heal her. That was the first reading. And my point yesterday, and I'll give a summary of it, is that we have to learn how to control our tongue. We have to learn how to control our tongue. So I'd like to give you some rules for speech and then let's move on to the great saint of the day and, and the gospel reading. Okay, the first rule for speech is we should first make an effort to talk to God. Talk to God before we talk to people. Because if we talk to God before we talk to people, then our conversation with people would be pleasing to God. You like that? So I'll repeat. First talk to God, then to people. Then when we talk to people, our conversation will be with people will be pleasing to God. So true. Second principle is taken from St. James chapter 3. St. James says we should be slow to speak and quick to listen. It's interesting we have two ears and one mouth, listening twice as much as we speak. Third principle is we have to learn to think before we speak. We shouldn't follow our impulses. For only impulse, so we follow our impulses, we're going to get into danger. We're going to get into trouble. The 
The fourth principle is this. What many of our parents taught us years ago. If you have nothing to say, then don't open up your mouth. And St. Bernard gives us three principles in speech. St. Bernard says we should open up our mouth to praise God, to accuse ourselves, and to edify our neighbor. Do you like that? We should open up our mouths to praise God. St. Ignatius says we're called to praise God, to accuse ourselves, and then to edify, which means to build up our neighbor. And never forget that all of our words that we say in this life will be judged on what we say by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So in a certain sense, every time we open up our mouths, our garden angel is pressing the recorder button. All our words, all our conversations are being recorded as are my words being recorded right now on my digital recorder. So we have to make, we should make an effort, my friends, to purify, to sanctify, to improve our speech. Not simply our grammar, but rather what we're saying, the content of what we're saying. We should pray that every time we go to someone by our speech and our example, we will bring them closer to God and bring ourselves closer to God too. That should be our intention. Then the gospel yesterday was Jesus sends the apostles in the boat. He prays on shore. They are three o'clock in the morning. The boat cannot cross because there's waves and wind. Jesus comes walking on the water at three o'clock in the morning. They cry out, it's a ghost, it's a ghost, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. Jesus says, get hold of yourself, it is I. And Peter says, if it's you, Lord, tell me to walk on the water. And Jesus says, come. Peter walks on the water. But he starts to sink. Why did he sink? Is because when he was walking in the water, he was focusing on Christ. He had his eyes riveted on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He lifted up his gaze from Christ and he focused more on the wind and the water. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus, man of little faith, and he grabs the hand of Peter, and Peter walks on the water. What is that message for us, my friends? I think the message is very clear. Is that in the midst of our storms of life, we all have storms. Some small, some are bigger. In the midst of the storms of life, we have to Fix our gaze on Christ. We need to focus more on the problem solver than on the problem. Yes, focus more on the problem solver than on the problem. Because we focus only on the problem, the problem is going to get worse and worse. The storm is going to engulf us and drown us. We focus upon Christ. He can help us to walk on water and to pass through the stormy winds and sea. How true. How true. So my friends, in the midst of the storms of life, let us focus on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He will help us. He has a saying in Spanish, El amigo que nunca falla. He is the friend that will never fail us. So, my friends, today I'd like to 
start out our conversation in on this day by giving you some ideas on the saint that we celebrate today. Today, my friends, we celebrate the memorial of a great priest saint. His name is Saint John Saint John Maria Vianney. known as the Curie of Arras. And I'd like to invite all of you to pray especially for priests. Because he's a true model for priests. So much so that Pope Benedict XVI, what he called the he called the year of the priest. He chose this saint to be the model of priests. And he's actually the patron of parish priests. His name is St. John Maria Vianney, but also known as the Curie of Arras. So he was born on May 8th, 1786, and died today. He died today, August 4th, 1859. 1859. The Curie of Arras. Okay, he was born into a very difficult time in church history. In a country that was in real turmoil. He was born in the time, my friends, of the French Revolution. And as a result, as a result of the French Revolution, the government, it was somewhat like the Cristero movement, the Cristero movement in Mexico in 1928 to the early 30s which the government wanted to suppress religion. They tried to suppress religion in Mexico, but also in France. They tried to suppress religion in the 1700s, in the early 1800s. That's when he was born. So he had to make his first Holy Communion in the barn which a priest had to come in and do it behind the government's back as, it, as would happen during the Christianos. Many of the practices of religion had to be done on the sly in which priests could not even dress as priests. Otherwise they'd be apprehended, thrown in jail, and, and many of them would be killed. So John Vianney, he helped his father on the farm. His father was a farmer. So, preaching and teaching religion was forbidden. So as a result of that, there was just a lot of ignorance in the country. So children and teenagers were growing up without any faith whatsoever. So as time went on and the French Revolution came to an end, Catholics once again were permitted to they were permitted to practice their faith. So young John Vianney wanted to become a priest but he had no formal education because of the revolution. Not only was religion suppressed, but also education was not sufficient for many. So 
he desired to become a priest and a priest friend named Father Ballet tutored the curie of ours. He took him under his wing and he educated him. Then what happened was the curie of ours was drafted into military service. So he was in military service, he deserted military service, came back home, and once again his priest friend helped him to study to become a priest. Helped him to study to become a priest. After a long, long struggle in which the Curivars really struggled learning things in Latin, learning the basics, failing at times, he made a long pilgrimage to St. Francis Regis, begging that this, Fran this saint would help him. After many failures and struggles, He was presented to the bishop. The bishop asked, asked questions about him. And the bishop was told that he was a man of great prayer and a man of great holiness. So the bishop decided, well, we'll ordain him. So he was ordained to the priesthood against all odds. So the first few years of his priesthood, first few years, he was in the parish with Father Ballet, who was his tutor. About three years he spent with this priest. And what he learned from Father Ballet was a deep prayer life, and also Father Ballet was a man of great, great penance, of mortification. Lived an ascetical life, very serious. Then Father Ballet got sick. He had a wound on his leg, and eventually he got weaker and weaker, and Father Ballet died. Now the bishop did not want to damage any people by sending this priest, John Vianney, who didn't seem to have too much education. So he decided to send him to a very small parish in, as we say, in the boondocks, out there in no man's land, so that he wouldn't do any damage. How ironic. How ironic this was. He's going to become one of the greatest priests in the history of Catholicism, send him into no man's land so he doesn't do any damage to the people. So the Curie of Ars takes off, he heads toward Ars, and he had never been there before. He had never been there before. So when he finally arrives at Ars, and if you ever go to Ars, you'll see a bit. You'll see a statue of what I'm going to be talking about now. He's lost. He doesn't know where the parish church is. He has no idea. He's never been there before. So he meets a little boy. And he says to the boy, "You show me to Ars, and I'll show you the way to heaven." 
You show me the ours and I will show you the way to heaven. So the little boy directs now the curie of ours to his parish. And when he arrives there, there is a rectory and the church is totally dilapidated. He sees the church in total disorder with dust, cobwebs, in other words, kind of looked like an old garage, a barn, in total disorder. So one of the things he'll do is to try to restore the beauty of the church. We have to try to restore the beauty of our church today in honor of the Curie Boris. But not only that, not only was the church in disorder, the physical church, but also the people were in disorder. The people were not happy to have a of a priest. They had been brought up because of the French Revolution without any, without any education, without the sacraments, living on an animal level, many of them. So they, he, he finds the rectory where he's his residence and there are a few things which he considered to be luxury and he got rid of them. So that he's going to be sleeping on the floor in his bed and living a life of extreme poverty. Because of his love of God and his love of souls. Now, when he arrives, just one person is going to be going to church. When he leaves, when he ends his life, only one person in the whole parish will not be going. How about that? When he arrives, one person goes to church. When he leaves, only one person in the parish does not go. The exact opposite. Now what did he do? What was his tactic to resuscitate or to bring to life a parish that was almost completely dead. Now one of the most serious problems he had, there were what you say in Spanish, cantinas. There were taverns and bars where there was a lot of drinking and immoral dancing. There was about four of them and he had to do, he had to preach out against them. And obviously the cantina owners were not going to be happy about this. But the cure of ours could care less what they thought about. He wanted to save souls. But this was the tactic of the Curie of ours. Number one, the Curie of ours, John Vianney, was going to storm heaven, storm heaven day and night with prayers. He would spend, my friends, long hours, I repeat, long hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament in prayer. Long hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament in prayer. Sometimes he'd spend the whole night in prayer. One of his prayers was, Lord, 
Send me any suffering you want, but save my parish. Convert my people. So much love he had for the salvation of these people. Another thing that he did was the following. Jesus said that some devils, some devils can be cast out only by prayer and fasting or penance. So he applied himself to fasting. What he would do at the beginning of the week, he'd get a, a pot, boil water, and he would boil potatoes. And he'd eat maybe two potatoes a day around midday. And there'd be days in which he would be fasting the whole day for the purpose of saving souls. For the purpose of saving souls. Third thing he did was in his room he got, he got rid of his bed and he'd sleep on the floor. But before sleeping on the floor, he did something else. He would scourge himself to the point also of shedding blood, recognizing that by prayer and penance and suffering, souls could be saved. Then one occasion, a pastor came to him and said, how is it that I can bring people back to my church? And the curie of ours said, do you pray? Do you fast? Do you also practice vigilance? Deprive yourself even of sleep? And the curie of ours said, when you do that, we almost render the devil impotent. So the cure of ours would sleep just a few hours at night. So, prayer, pr long hours of prayer, fasting, deprivation of sleep, sleeping on the floor, scourging himself to the point of shedding blood, as a result of this, my friends, things happened. Not just like this. Because one of the verses we see in the Curie of Curivaris is that of his infinite patience. Patience with God, patience with others, patience with himself, patience, patience, patience. How important it is that we beg for the virtue of patience. Then what he did was he would start to go and visit the homes in his parish. The church was not enormously big and his parish did not have too many people in it. So he'd go and visit the homes and listen to them and encourage them. So in time, the people started to come back to the practice of the faith. And in time, what's going to happen, not only do the people come back to the practice of the faith, but people are coming not simply from ours, but they're coming from all over the place, other towns, other villages, other cities, even other countries. So much so that they'd have to have to build a, a train station to arrive at ours. Arrived at a point where people would have to wait sometimes three to four days to be able to arrive at the confessional of the Curie of ours. And usually he would spend about maybe three minutes 
with every penitent, and he wouldn't say that much. And he'd sometimes just give short advice. For example, a bishop comes and he just says this to the bishop, love your priests. That's all he said. Love your priests. That was his prayer. So uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, I'd like to, I was reading and meditating upon it this morning. What would be, what would be a typical day? What would be a typical day in the life of the Curie of Ars? Now think about your typical day. Maybe look at the day you give for the 24 hours. How do you use your time? On Sunday, in which we celebrate the feast day of St. Alphonsus Maria Liguri. St. Alphonsus Maria Liguri did so much because he was a man of God. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. But also St. Alphonso Liguri, like many saints, and very much like the Curie of Ars, is made a vow which is called the Seraphic Vow, which means, the Seraphic Vows means not to waste time, but to use time to glorify God and to save souls and for our own sanctification. So what I'd like to do with you right now is I'd like to go through a typical day in the life of the Curie of ours known as St. John Maria Vianney. And uh, just to think about how he used his time and how do we use our time. I'd right also of you to pray for more priests because the harvest is rich and the labors are few, as well as for the sanctification of priests. Okay. What am I doing now is this is when the Curie of ours has already broken through the resistance of the people. Those uh, four cantinas or bars, they're all closed. The owners, of course, were very angry at the Curie of ours because they lost their business. But these cantinas or bars were keeping people away from God. People were drinking. People were giving in to immorality. People were becoming slaves of their passions. So much so that the Curie of Ars said this. Listen to this. And this would get the bar owners furious. Whenever anyone goes into one of these cantinas or bars, he leaves his guardian angel outside and he walks in with the devil. Wow! Remember I once said this in Argentina because there's a lot of cantinas there. I don't think that the young people like that homily at all. I repeat. When someone goes into this bar cantina, he leaves his guardian angel outside and he walks in with the devil. That's his chaperone. So the Curie of ours was able to, through his prayer, penance, preaching, he's able to close these sources of deprivation, sources of sin. So here we have a typical day in the life of the Curie of Ars. He would, 
he would get up in the morning. Guess when he would get up? He'd get up at midnight. That's right. Many people are going to bed. He's getting up. And what he would do, is he would open up the church door and he would ring the bell. The bell, so that the people recognize that the church is open. How important it is for us to have our church doors open? You know, in our parish, we open up our doors at about 5 o'clock in the morning. And then after the 12 noon Mass, we have adoration from 1 o'clock until 6 o'clock, five hours of adoration. Let's pray that priests will be able to open up the doors of the church for their people. And after spending some time in prayer in front of the Blessed Sacrament, don't forget this is this is midnight, twelve midnight. And he would confess. And there would be there would be a block of people online waiting to go to confession. Now from midnight until about six o'clock the cure of eyes had a style. He had a pastoral style. He would first confess the men. That's right. So the first block of time was dedicated to men. So that would be, he'd, he'd be confessing up until six. So probably a good five and a half hours, six hours confessing men. And then he would pray the Psalms. What he's doing, he's spending a, a good block of time in preparation for Holy Mass. Psalms, his devotions in preparation for Mass. At seven o'clock he would, he would celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass was the very center of his life. So should it be with us. The source and summit of our life, my friends, should be the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. The bishop, seeing how hard he worked, said that after Mass he should go and have a little breakfast. So he'd go and have a little bit of milk to drink. So after his quick breakfast, which would be about 8 o'clock in the morning, the Curie of ours would confess from 8 o'clock in the morning until 11. And he'd confess the women. That's right, he confessed the women. So first the men, early in the morning, Then from 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock, he confessed the women. Now here's another very important element of his life. At 11 o'clock, the curie of ours would come out of the confessional, and he'd still have a long line. And he go into the pulpit, and he would 
teach the people catechism. So we have the preachings, we have the teachings, the catechism of the Curie of Ours, which you can listen to or you can read. There's someone that was very critical of the way he preached. He said his, his sermons or homilies were very long. He said they're very demanding. And then he would repeat the same themes. But people were converted because he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. He would denounce the evil of vice and the beauty of virtue. In Vatican II points out, two of the principal duties of the priest, I invite all of you to pray for priests. Pray for priests and honor the Curie of Ours. Pray for priests and honor the Curie of Ours. The priest is called to pray for his people. He's called also to preach, to teach, to catechize the people, to teach them the truth. So from 11 until about noon, the Curie of ours would be teaching the people. Then at 12 noon, he would leave the church to go to his rectory to, for about an hour. Sometime for him to make it, he'd have to have a handful of medals and throw them up in the air and the people would grab onto him so they wouldn't grab onto him. So he arrives at the rectory between 12 and 1. He'd have a meal. And as we mentioned earlier, he would he would boil potatoes at the beginning of the week. He'd have about two potatoes a day. Then he would shave, sometime rest a little bit. And also he would visit either the poor. Or he actually established, my friends, an orphanage for poor girls. Uh, an orphanage for poor girls that were in danger. So he would sometimes go and visit his orphanage, which was right next to the parish. All this was done in about an hour. In other words, he didn't waste time, did he? Then at one o'clock, at one o'clock, about one thirty, an hour and a half, he would confess once again. He would confess from one thirty. all the way up to about eight o'clock. One thirty up to about eight o'clock. Then he would head back to his parish, to the rectory. He'd read a little bit the lives of the saints. And then he would go to bed. So you only have four hours there. He would sleep on the floor. He would sometimes scourge himself. And not only that, but the cure of ours had, had a visitor. The visitor was the devil. The devil would come to visit the Curie of ours. 
he would insult him, he would drag chains, sometimes he'd even set his room on fire. And at first the cure of ours was a little bit scared, but then he would not worry at all. So much so that the more commotion that he experienced from the devil, the more he'd rejoice. And he said when there was a lot of commotion from the devil, then the following day there would probably be a big fish. In other words, there would be a big sinner that would be coming to ours and go to confession. Once a lawyer traveled a long way to see the cure of ours. And afterward they asked the lawyer, what did you see in ours? And the lawyer said, I saw God in a human person. The cure of ours reflected great holiness of life. So my friends, that would be the typical day of the cure of ours. Basically working from 12 to 8 o'clock with an hour and a half break at midday. Eat a little bit, shave, rest a little bit, visit the orphans, maybe visit the sick person. In other words, what we see in the cure of ours is a man totally dedicated to God, to his vocation, to his mission, and to the salvation of souls. So I think, my friends, we have to pray for priests. Pray that we get more priests. Pray that we get holy priests. Pray that we, get, we, we have priests that are very zealous to praise God and to save souls. And I have a surprise, I have a gift. Right here I have a first class relic of the Curie of Ars. This is the first class relic of the Curie of Ars. When I say first class relic, I mean this. This is a part, little part of the bone, little part of the bone of the Holy Curie of Ars. How privileged. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to end our Perseverance family conversation by giving you all a blessing with the first class relic of the Curie of Ars, St. John Maria Vianney. And I invite all of you to pray for priests, for future priests. The Lord be with you. Through the intercession of St. John Maria Vianney, may God bless all of you in a very special way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. John Maria Vianney, pray for us. May God bless you and pray for priests and for the sanctification of priests. Because your sanctification, your holiness, depends a lot upon having holy priests that love God and want to work for the salvation of souls. So 
For an honor to your bars, pray for priests and for the sanctification of priests. Amen.